Good morning, everyone. It's good to be here with you today. Uh, last week, we finished up 1 Timothy, and this week, we're going to start on 2 Timothy. Last week, I handed out to you a copy of my translation of 2 Timothy, and um, if you don't have one, if you weren't here last week, or if for some reason you didn't get one, um, see Walter, and he will make sure you get a copy this morning. All right. <clears throat> uh, we remember, hopefully, we remember that uh, 1 Timothy was written by the Apostle Paul uh, from Laodicea, probably not too long after he had left Timothy there in Ephesus. And Timothy's instructions um, were to train and ordain elders in the church in Ephesus. And um, now we come to 2 Timothy, quite a bit of time, perhaps two, three, maybe even four years have elapsed since the Apostle Paul uh, left uh, Timothy there at Ephesus. And what, is, what has transpired is that the Apostle Paul was arrested in um, Jerusalem. He stood trial in Caesarea, and then he, was, he appealed to Caesar because he was being railroaded, and so he was shipped off to Rome. He was put in prison in Rome where he was to stand trial and perhaps be executed or perhaps be found not guilty and released. Well, we know that uh, ultimately um, Paul was found not guilty and he was released. And we also know that, uh, by the way, um, the book of Acts ends with the Apostle Paul in, in Rome in prison that first time. Um, not knowing whether he was going to die in Rome or be released. Well, we know from history that the Apostle Paul was released, and he traveled, actually continued his missionary journeys, which are not actually recorded in the book of Acts. But he continued traveling, and he got as far as Spain uh, going west. And at some point, he returned and was rearrested and... Uh, sent to Rome as well to stand trial the second time. And the second time, the Apostle Paul was um, executed for preaching the gospel. Now, this book, 2 Timothy, was written by Paul while he was in prison the second time. That is just before his execution. It's sort of like um, 2 Timothy is the last words of the Apostle Paul to probably his dearest protege. Paul had several young men that he had trained um, to carry on his work, but Timothy was probably the one that he felt the closest to and loved the most. And um, they seemed to have this real bond between them like a father and a son. And uh, so the Apostle Paul, in writing this letter, um, you can see the affection that Paul has for Timothy, for Timothy's faithful service uh, to Paul and to Christ, of course, up until this point while he had been at Ephesus. And now the Apostle Paul's last words to his, what he calls, my own son in the faith. So let's begin reading um, 2 Timothy chapter 1. Let's read uh, verses 1 and 2 first. Paul, emissary of Jesus Christ, through the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Master. Now, the first thing I want to point out to you is that the Apostle Paul does here what he almost always does in his letters. The exception is the book of Hebrews. But all the other letters of Paul, he starts out by laying out his credentials. Now, you may, you may remember in uh, Philippians that the Apostle Paul talked about his former credentials that he had, uh, you know, being a Pharisee, being, uh, you know, all, all the different um, 
qualifications, you might say his degree. In one place he talked about uh, have, that he had been trained um, under Gamaliel, who was a famous rabbi um, uh, in the book of Acts. And so the Apostle Paul had a lot of credentials as a uh, up-and-coming scholar, if you will, uh, in, the, in the Jewish faith prior to his arrest, I'm sorry, <laughs> prior to his conversion on the road to Damascus. But on the road to Damascus, all that changed. Right? Paul saw the bright light and, and uh, Jesus appeared to him. And in Philippians, when he's, he's kind of talking about his calling, and he says, I counted all that the past, all that I had achieved prior to that incident when Christ called him. He says, I, I consider all that to be rubbish that I might gain Christ. And now Paul, after that major crisis in his life, where his life made a 180 degree turn, Paul is no longer what he used to be. Now he is an emissary of Jesus Christ. And what that literally means is someone who has been personally called and personally sent and commissioned by Jesus Christ himself. Let's look briefly at uh, what Paul has to say about his commission when he was giving a defense um, in Acts chapter 26. Let's look at there. Acts chapter 26 and um, verses 15 through 18. This is, this is uh, fascinating. You know, the account of Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus and that change in his life, that total turnaround in his life, is actually described <coughs> excuse me, three times in the book of Acts. The first two times, um, it's not Paul telling his own story. But in, in Acts chapter 26, we actually have Paul's own words where he's recounting what Jesus said to him on the road to Damascus as he was uh, actually standing trial at his first, just before his first, or at the time of his first imprisonment. Um, let's look at verses uh, 15 through 18. <clears throat> so I said, who are you, Lord? This is when uh, he heard the voice from heaven and um, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, but rise, stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose. Was it to save Paul? No. See, it was to commission Paul, to send Paul. I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you. See, Paul was told by Christ himself, that he was being sent on a mission to the Gentiles, which is why he traveled to all these Gentile cities. Verse 18. To open their eyes, that is the Gentiles, in order to turn them from darkness to light. Darkness is what? Ignorance. Light is what? The revelation and knowledge of God. And from the power of Satan to God, that they, the Gentiles, may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those that are sanctified by the faith in me. So what he's saying essentially is, Paul, I'm sending you out so that you can turn these Gentiles from darkness, that is their ignorance, to light, from the power of Satan, and that is because Satan is the deceiver. The ignorance that was in the Gentiles was because of Satan, and his deception through paganism and so forth um, to God, and that they might receive forgiveness of sins, which is a precursor. It is necessary to receive the forgiveness of sins if you want to have what he says next, which is an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Now, this inheritance is very important, and we're going to see in verse 3 in a moment that he alludes to it again, in a sense. <clears throat> All right, let's continue reading on verse 1 of um, 2 Timothy chapter 1. Paul, emissary of Jesus Christ, that is, one sent by Christ himself, through the will of God, 
according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. The promise of life. You may remember uh, from last week, we briefly, well, not briefly, <laughs> we looked at uh, the end of 1 Timothy. I want you to turn back there for just a moment. This, this idea of attaining to the promise of life is a constant theme in, in Paul's epistles, but 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy both uh, mention it frequently. Go back to uh, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. In verse 11, he said, But you, O man of God, flee these things, that is, the pursuit of wealth, pursue justice, devoutness, trust, love, endurance, and humility, contend the ideal contest of the faith, and then look at this, take hold of age-enduring life. Now, it's age-enduring life in contrast to the life that we have now, which is not age-enduring. The life we have now is temporary. Adam sinned, and the curse was placed on creation, but Adam's penalty for sin was what? Right, death. All mankind now is susceptible to death. No one would live beyond one age, that is one millennium, because of Adam's sin. No man has ever lived beyond a millennium. But age enduring life was a promise that God gave. So he tells Timothy here, take hold of age enduring life into which you were invited and profess the ideal profession before many witnesses. Now how, how do we take hold of age enduring life? What is age enduring life? It is the resurrection to eternal life, right? And then he says in verse 13, I charge you before the God who is sustaining life in all things. And this statement, as we mentioned before, refers to the fact that life itself is continuously provided by God. There's no person here who's alive today or anywhere else who's alive today that is not every moment of every day dependent on God to continue to give him life, to continue to sustain his life. Life is not possible without God's direct interaction. It does not happen by evolution. It does not, not happen by lightning hitting some swamp gas. It cannot happen unless God is actively involved in the process. But he says, God... Um, I charge you before the God who is sustaining life in all things. Then go down to verse 15. He's talking about uh, the Father. He says, Who in his own appointed times will display the blessed and only sovereign, that's the Father, the King of kings and Master of masters, who alone has immortality. This statement here clearly shows that the doctrine of um, the immortality of the soul is a false doctrine. It's a false teaching. There are no beings that inherently possess immortality of themselves except God, the self-sufficient one. He alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light and so forth. Go down to verse 19. He says, um, verse 18, he's, he wants them, him to teach the rich to be rich in good deeds, to be liberal, liberal contributors, banking for themselves an ideal foundation for what is coming so that they may take hold of age and during life. You see, what, what we find throughout Paul's epistles is that age and during life, or what is commonly referred to as eternal life in most translations, was something that Christians held the promise to but had not yet received the actual substance of the promise. That is, living forever. That's what age enduring life means. The Apostle Paul said that he had not attained it yet in Philippians chapter 3. The Apostle Paul tells Timothy to take hold of age enduring life. And he tells the, the, uh, Timothy to teach the rich Christians um, to do certain things so that they may take hold of age and during life. Does that not imply that we are not immortal now? See, this doctrine that, that you are really just a ghost living in a flesh suit 
and that you are really immortal in, ver in your very nature, and that your body and your flesh is just a temporary accessory to who you are is a false doctrine. It came from paganism and then from Greek philosophy. It entered into Judaism and Christianity later. But it's not what the Word of God teaches, and it is not what the Apostle Paul taught and believed. It's a false doctrine. So, the promise, the commission that God gave to Paul was that he sent him out to the Gentiles to turn them from darkness to light so that they might have an inheritance, and that inheritance requires eternal life. It requires living forever. Now, verse 2. He says to Timothy, beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Master. I like the fact that he calls him beloved son. This, that clearly shows that affection that the Apostle Paul had. Now, why does he say, in verse 1, why does he say the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus? See, the pro we know what the promise of life is, okay? Why is it in Christ Jesus? Well, for one thing, it's because according to John chapter 5, verse 25, Jesus said that in the resurrection to eternal life, that is to immortality, the dead are going to hear the voice of the Son of Man, and those who hear shall live. And this is why also at the second coming, the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians that there will be a shout, and then the voice of the archangel, and then the trumpet of God. Just as Jesus called forth the, uh, Lazarus from his tomb, he's going to call forth the dead believers from their tombs, and they're going to be raised from the dead. This is the promise of life. So he says that is in Christ Jesus, because Christ Jesus is the one who is going to call the dead forth out of their graves. But secondly, because even after the dead are called out of their graves to receive this age-enduring life. According to Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, Jesus is the one that will control access to the tree of life. You remember that tree of life, the tree that was in the Garden of Eden, the tree where after Adam sinned and death was pronounced upon him, Immediately, God drove him out of the Garden of Eden and he stationed angels to guard the way so that Adam could not enter back into the Garden of Eden and eat from the Tree of Life and live forever, right? And have immortality by eating from that tree. So it's not just the fact that, that um, <coughs> Christ, this, the promise of life that is in Christ is not only in Christ because he's the one that calls us forth out of our graves, but he is the one who controls access to the tree of life from then on. Who is going to eat from the tree of life and who is not, even during that millennium um, when Christ reigns on the earth. All right, let's read verses uh, 3 through 5. I am grateful to God to whom I offer divine service from the forefathers in a clean conscience as I have constant remembrance of you in my prayers night and day, Longing to see you, having been reminded of your tears, so that I may be filled with joy, calling to mind the earnest trust in you, which first resided in, in your grandmother Lois, in your mother Eunice, and I have been convinced that it resides in you also. Now, this statement in verse 3 is very interesting. Look at, look at this again. I am grateful to God, to whom I offer divine service from the forefathers. Now, the, the word there that's translated divine service is used throughout the Bible in the Old Testament and also in the book of Hebrews whenever it's referring to what the priests did, the Levites and the priests did at the temple. Now, they had the priests and Levites had many jobs. But their job, essentially, if you want to boil it down to one thing, it was in handling the holy things of God and administering the holy things of God to the people. Isn't that right? They were also the teachers 
of the law. So the Apostle Paul here applies to himself a term that is virtually everywhere else used of the law and the priesthood under the law. He applies it to himself. But what's fascinating about this is he makes a distinction so that we know that he's not talking about the fact that he himself is a priest of the Levitical priesthood and that he's working at the temple. <clears throat> what does he say? I'm grateful to God to whom I offer divine service from the forefathers. Now, you have to understand who the forefathers are. Who are the forefathers? When, he, when that term is used in Romans and in other epistles, what is he referring to? Who are the forefathers? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Those three men are the forefathers. And then from Jacob, all 12 tribes um, were produced. But you had Abraham, who had Isaac as his son, and then his grandson, Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And you'll see these three mentioned in the Gospels. You'll see them mentioned all over the place. And whenever they are, those three are mentioned together, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the context is always talking about the covenant that God made with Abraham. And the reason we know that is because he made the same covenant after he made it with Abraham, with Isaac, and then with Jacob. Let's look at that very briefly. Um, Genesis chapter 13. <clears throat> Excuse me. Verse 14. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Lift up your eyes and look from this place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see, I give to you and your seed forever. Now, it's, it's critical, and I've, I've said this many times, and most of you guys know exactly what I'm going to say, <laughs> but it's critical that we understand that the promise of the eternal land inheritance was given to Abraham personally and to his seed in addition to Abraham. He, God repeated it again, and it's very important that you see it's not just to your seed, but to you and to your seed as two distinct entities. All right. He repeated it in Genesis chapter 17, verses 7 and 8. Flip over there. <coughs> And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your seed after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant. Note the words everlasting covenant because Hebrews uses that term in reference to the new covenant. He says, um, for an everlasting covenant to be a God to you and your seed after you. Also, I give to you and your seed after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Everlasting possession. Do you see the connection to everlasting life? It's important because in our mortal bodies, we're all going to die. No one is going to live forever. No man has ever lived more, more over a millennium, over a thousand years. How can you have an eternal land possession? How can you have an inheritance unless you're going to live beyond the millennium, right? So <clears throat> he's telling Abraham, I'm going to give this land to you and your seed after you um, as an everlasting possession. Now go over to Genesis chapter 26. Now Abraham has died, and, and um, um, Isaac, his son, um, verse 3, the promise is repeated to Isaac, his son. Verse, verse 2, then the Lord appeared to him and said, this to Isaac, do not go down to Egypt, live in the land which I shall tell you, dwell in this land, and I will be with you and bless you, for to you, Isaac, Abraham's son, and your seed. Again, two entities. The promise is directly to you, and in addition, it's to your seed. Um, 
I give these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. Had Abraham received the promise, the, the fulfillment of the promise, in his lifetime. No, because he's still saying, God's still putting it in the future after Abraham was dead. He's telling Isaac, I'm going to fulfill the promise I made to Abraham. And I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give you and your seed all these lands, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. The New Testament applies that promise to Christ. Because Abraham obeyed my voice, and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So we see that the covenant God made with Abraham is repeated to Isaac, but not just repeated that God's going to fulfill the covenant he made to Abraham, but he's going to fulfill it to Isaac as well and his seed. And then in chapter 28 of Genesis, <clears throat> when Isaac is blessing his son Jacob, which is now Abraham's grandson, He's passing the promise along to his son. He says to, <clears throat> Isaac says to Jacob, May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may be an assembly of peoples and give you the blessing of Abraham to you and your seed with you. Notice the distinction. You and your seed with you. That's important. Because what it says is the fulfillment of the promise that God made to Abraham is going to be fulfilled to Isaac. That is, Isaac is going to inherit the land as an everlasting possession along with his descendants, with them. That is, when his descendants inherit the land, his seed inherits the land, then Isaac will inherit the land. That you... Isaac may inherit the land in which you are a strange... I'm sorry, Isaac. Isaac's saying this to Jacob. That you, Jacob, may inherit the land in which you are a stranger, which God gave to Abraham. Go over to verse 13. Now God confirms what Isaac, to Jacob directly what Isaac, his father, said to him. When Jacob had the dream of the latter, he says, And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father. And the God of Isaac, which was um, his father as well. Abraham was his grandfather. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your seed. Again, he makes a distinction. He doesn't just say, I'm going to give it to your seed after you're dead. He says, I'm going to give it to you and your seed, both as distinct entities. Now, go over to um, Genesis chapter 35. <clears throat> Again, to Jacob, verse 11. Actually, let's start in verse 9. Then God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Padan Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, Your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. God said to him, I am, the, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply a nation, and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and kings will come from your body. The land which I gave to Abraham and Isaac, your grandfather and your father, I give to you and to your descendants after you, I give this land. You see the distinction, right? Now, the New Testament teaches, Galatians chapter 3, verse 16, that the seed in those promises to, this, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he says, I'm going to give it to you and your seed. That the seed there is Christ. Genesis, or I'm sorry, Galatians 3.16 makes that point clear. It qu actually quotes from these passages, and it says that he did not say seed singular, but he said, and to your seeds, plural, and then Paul says, and that seed is Christ. He goes on then to say that those of us who are baptized into Jesus Christ have put on Christ, and if you are Christ's, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That is the promise of the covenant that God made with Abraham. So, back to um, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. 
when the Apostle Paul says, I am grateful to God to whom I offer divine service, using that term that's used in the law of Moses in reference to the priests functioning with the holy things of God. Paul qualifies that by saying, not the divine service of the law, but the divine service from the forefathers, from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know what this is saying, essentially? It's saying very clearly that the new covenant, you remember when uh, in Jeremiah 31, when God said that um, he was going to uh, make a new covenant with the house of Israel, not according to the old covenant, the law that he made at Mount Sinai, but he was going to make a new covenant because they broke the old covenant. The new covenant is the supernatural fulfilling of the Abrahamic covenant. You see, when God gave Abraham those promises, he then allowed Abraham, he allowed, excuse me, Abraham's descendants, the 12 tribes, to have the opportunity to fulfill the promises that God made through Abraham. And he gave them his law through Moses, and he said, if you keep my law, I'm going to give you the promises that I gave to Abraham. But they didn't keep his law. And he said, if you don't keep my law, I'm going to drive you out of the land. In other words, it's not going to be an everlasting inheritance for you. But then what we see is the new covenant that Jeremiah prophesies about and that the New Testament tells us is fulfilled through Jesus Christ. What the new covenant is, is the supernatural working out or fulfilling of the covenant that God made with Abraham because in the natural, by man's own effort of keeping God's commandments, he fell flat on his face through the law. So what does God do? He comes along and he sends his son, Jesus Christ, to bring about and to fulfill the Abrahamic covenant in a way that's different from what the law said. The law, again, could be kept, but it had to be kept through your own efforts. Christ now comes along and provides a, as what Hebrews calls a new and living way. And what does that mean? It's a new and living way to receive the promises of the Abrahamic covenant by supernatural means instead of by natural means. And this is why the Apostle Paul says in verse 3, I'm grateful to God to whom I offer divine service from the forefathers. That is from the, the Abrahamic covenant, from the covenant that God made with Abraham. But he's doing it through Jesus because Christ himself fulfilled the promises. He is the seed now of Abraham because the natural seed of Abraham failed and does not receive the promises of the Abrahamic covenant unless now they're in Christ. All right, verse 3. I am grateful to God to whom I offer divine service from the forefathers in a clean conscience. As I have constant remembrance of you in my prayers night and day, Paul's praying for Timothy day after day, night after night. Verse 4. Longing to see you, having been reminded of your tears, so that I may be filled with joy. Now, this is interesting. Having been reminded of your tears, well, what tears was Paul talking about? When Paul is talking about some incident where Timothy was really crying and shedding tears in Paul's presence. And is that incident ever recorded in the scriptures? Well, there are difference, differences of opinion. But my opinion is that this incident that Paul's talking about is the one that's recorded in Acts chapter 20. So let's go there for just a moment. Acts 20, verse uh, 16. <clears throat> you remember Paul left, in 1 Timothy, Paul left Timothy in Ephesus, and, and, and Timothy was with Paul in Ephesus for a significant period of time. And then on his way, on Paul, after he had traveled another uh, for a while, he came back through Ephesus, and while he was there, 
He called the, um, actually he wasn't in Ephesus. He was just off the, um, Ephesus was just off the coast. Paul's ship landed just a little bit farther south along the coast, and so he, he sent a messenger up to have the elders of the church of Ephesus come down and meet him. Now, no doubt, Timothy was in this gathering of Paul and the uh, elders of the church in Ephesus, the, the few elders that they do, did have. And Paul gives this long speech um, about you know, how he had been among them, how he had taught them faithfully, and so forth. We're not going to read all the speech. <clears throat> but he, if you go down to... Um, um, let's, go, let's look at the end of his speech. He says, uh, there, verse 31, Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who are with me. I have shown you in every way that laboring like this, you must support the weak and remember the words of our Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. Then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke, that they would see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. See, Paul knew, actually, he was on his way to Jerusalem, and, and he, it had been prophesied over him that when he got to Jerusalem, he was going to be arrested and sent to prison, and that he was, he was going to see Rome as well. And so Timothy, no doubt, was among these people who Paul said, look, this is probably, this is the last time you're going to see my face on this earth before the resurrection. And as they parted, there was a lot of weeping, and Timothy was there among them. And, you know, when Paul says this in, um, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, he says that uh, he, was, he was in constant remembrance of you in my prayers night and day, longing to see you, having been reminded of your tears. And, you know, that fondness that, that Paul had for Timothy that we'll see throughout this epistle was clearly reciprocated by Timothy as well. He loved Paul dearly as his father in the faith. And um, the idea that Paul was going to be separated from him, that he may never see Paul's face again, knowing that he was carrying on a part of Paul's mission, and that if Paul did was executed in Rome, that Timothy would be without him, but he would carry on because of the training that the Apostle Paul gave him. And so Paul, now here he is in prison in Rome the second time, and he's remembering, as he's praying for Timothy, and he's remembering his love, great affection and love for Paul, his teacher and his mentor. And so Paul's remembering that, and he's praying for Timothy night and day. And why was Paul praying for Timothy night and day? We'll see a little bit later in the book that Paul knew, he absolutely knew that this time he was not going to walk out of prison a free man. This time he was going to be executed. He knew that. He says that very plainly later in the book, and that's exactly what happened. Um, by the way, Paul was executed shortly after writing this book. So he's praying for Timothy, who he has invested so much of his time, so much of his effort. They have been through so many experiences together as Paul traveled from place to place with Timothy and, and persecution. The two of them had been persecuted together in other places. And this affection for Timothy and his prayer for Timothy and for his strength. He says, look what he says here. I'm longing to see you having been reminded of your tears so that I may be filled with joy. <laughs> Paul is praying that he would be filled with joy while he's facing the executioner, knowing that the investment that he has put into Timothy is going to go on, that his ministry is going to continue even after his death because of all of this work. He says, so that I may be filled with joy, calling to mind. This is, Paul, this is what gave Paul more confidence that Timothy was going to stay the course even after his death. 
He says, calling to mind the earnest trust in you, which first resided in your grandmother Lois and then your mother Eunice, and I have been convinced that it resides also in you. And we'll, you can see if you turn to 2 Timothy 3.15, we won't go there now, but that Paul reminds Timothy that from a child you have known the Holy Scriptures. He was raised in the Scriptures by his mother and by his grandmother. And Paul was confident that that great investment that he had put in Timothy was going to go on and it was going to re reap many, many, many rewards, much fruit in the life of Timothy. Well, let's end there. We'll pick it up again uh, next week.